Good morning, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jang Choi from Severance Cardiovascular Hospital, Yonsei University, Seoul, Korea. I would like to first uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference and giving me an opportunity to talk today. My talk is about uh, introduction of a PF foreclosure. I'd first like to address on the rationale of a PF foreclosure and then talk about the techniques and the details considerations for PFO closure. Why do we close a PFO? PFO is the most common cause of a systemic right to eruption and may lead to many diseases as listed in this slide. Also, it is known that the patients with cryptogenic stroke or migraine more frequently have PFO than normal population. The association of PFO and cryptogenic stroke has been consistently documented in multiple studies. And it has been reported from many non-randomized studies that PFO, uh, PF, closure of the PFO may prevent the recurrence of a cryptogenic stroke. However, there also have been debates on the role of PFO closure for secondary prevention of a cryptogenic stroke. So there have been many uh, twists and turns until the FDA finally approved the PFO closure with the amplifier device last October. Then what is the current evidence for PFO closure? As we all know, recent randomized trials designed to uh, prove the superiority of PFO closure over standard medical therapy for secondary prevention of cryptogenic stroke failed to meet primary endpoint. However, we have learned that the procedure and devices are safe, and uh, all the trials show the tendency toward the reduction of uh, risk by PFO closure. Furthermore, some sub-analysis already reached to stat statistical significance favoring device closure. The common problems of these trials include large dropout rate, statistically underpowered study, uneven medical exposure, and the potential selection bias. Many people think the studies have been designed with too optimistic expectations and uh, in a hasty way. As a consequence for the follow-up observation for respect to trial had been continued, and the superiority of PF closure over medical therapy in preventing recurrent cryptogenic stroke had been proven for all uh, analysis populations. So they concluded that the PFO closure using amplifier PFO device is uh, superior to medical management in reducing the recurrent cryptogenic ischemic stroke. On the other hand, an outburst of meta-analysis on this topic has emerged since 2013. Most of the studies revealed the substantial benefit of PFO closure except for a few studies reporting failure to uh, reach the statistical difference. I would like to briefly introduce most recent meta-analysis involving the three representative randomized trials. The pooled analysis of closure one, PC, and RESPECT trial revealed the device closure was significantly more effective to prevent ischemic stroke than medical therapy alone. This was also true for analysis of disc calculators, and the effect was even uh, stronger. So the number needed to treat to prevent one stroke over two years was 62, and when assuming the benefit for 15 to 20 years in this population, the, need, uh, the NNT is reduced to 8 to 11, which is significantly lower than ICD implantation. Next topic is how to close a PFO. The techniques of PFO closure may have wider range of variation than AST closure. Debates are still going on from almost every details, including initial workup, post-procedure follow-up, as well as selection of types and size of the device. And I would like, just like to briefly introduce my own way to, of doing it. <clears throat> Accurate initial diagnosis is very important, and a proper indication of PFO closure has to be confirmed before the procedure. 
contrast strength esophageal echocardiography is known as a gold standard, and it may provide an additional important information, such as thrombus in the LA appendage. Transsorus echo or transcranial Doppler with contrast may also be used to confirm the PFO. This slide summarizes the uh, closure procedure. Just to pick up some important point, I'm using both floral and ice guidance throughout the procedure. Nearly always balloon size, usually use an amplifier type device. Device size is determined by observation from balloon interrogation and they consider an AS device when the balloon waist is larger than 12 millimeter. When the LT rim is relatively short, I also consider an AS device or a go septal occluder. Patient is observed overnight, or, uh, of course, the heparin eyes as a P APTT between 50 and 80 seconds, followed with ECG, chest X-ray, and echo is done on the next day, one month, six months, one year after the procedure, and yearly thereafter, for at least five years. Low-dose aspirin and or clotopidogrel is given at least six months, and follow the neurologist's opinion regarding the further medical treatment. Pifos and PERS. There have been efforts to clarify the details of complications associated with the ASD and PFO closure. This slide shows periprocedural complications from a meta-analysis involving a large population of 28,000 uh, patients. Device embolization comprised nearly 70% of the major complication of ASD closure. However, the risk of device embolization in PFO closure was one seventh than in ASD patients. Both major and minor complications appear to be more frequent in ASD patients than in PFO patients, except for the cerebrovascular events. The leading causes of complications at follow-up were cerebrovascular events, device thrombosis, and arrhythmias. Interestingly, all of those were far more frequent in PFO patients than ASD patients, which may reflect the different nature of the underlying disease rather than the procedure or device itself. Therefore, potential predisposing risk factors of stroke other than PFO should be thoroughly investigated before the procedure so that the best medical treatment can be planned to prevent the subsequent stroke. In this point of view, closing an innocent PFO may mislead the subsequent medical therapy and potentially results in a secondary stroke indirectly. That is one of the reasons why accurate initial diagnosis, diagnosis is critically important. This slide shows a case with a cryptogenic stroke. The patient was referred from another hospital for PS4 closure. The contrast intracardiac echo showed a negative finding with uh, just a spontaneous echo on Balsaba maneuver. And uh, uh, Guide wire positions at the suspicious PFO tunnel didn't uh, pass into the, LA, uh, into the LA. The patient also showed a negative result on contrast transcranial Doppler. <clears throat> As you can see in this case, pseudo contrast caused by Balsalva effect uh, with a transient uh, stagnation of blood in the pulmonary veins may uh, be in misinterpreted as positive contrast. Uh, study. Other reasons for first positive bubble study may include additional unidentified ASD and um, mistaking a large eustachian bubble as a part of interatrial septum. Also, bubble studies may result in first negative findings because of inadequate opacification of RA, an inadequate balsaba maneuver, the presence of eustachian bubble directing IBC blood to the, to the atrial septum, presence of LV diastolic dysfunction, and so on. An echocardiographer has to be well acquainted of these mechanisms causing false positive or false negative findings. Pulmonary arterial venous fistula may be frequently misdiagnosed as PFO by the contrast echo as well as the contrast transcranial Doppler study. Positive contrast findings can be seen in both the diseases. However, the appearance of bubbles in left heart is usually delayed more than three to six heartbeats after RA filling in pulmonary artery venous fistula, as you can see in this slide. 
Palmar AV fistulas uh, may also be seen on simple chest X-ray. In cases with local nodular shadow in the lung field, palmar arterial venous fistula should be suspected. This patient with cryptogenic stroke had both PFO and palmar AV fistula. If you close the PFO only, remaining palmar arterial venous fistula may um, potentially cause another stroke in the future. This slide shows rare association of PFO and persistent level atrial cardinal vein in a patient with a cryptogenic stroke. We closed both defects to eliminate any potential source of paradoxical embolism. Proper selection of the device should also be an important part of the procedure. To select the proper type and size of the device, it is necessary to understand the anatomic characteristics of PFO on an individual basis. You can see various types of PFOs with different behavior in this slide. If you re uh, just rely on the natural shape of the PFO, you may encounter problems with device positioning, device stability, as well as procedural efficacy. Balloon sizing or balloon interrogation may provide important additional information on the properties of the PFO tunnel. This slide shows uh, an interesting study. Because PFO is a slit-like tunnel in most of the cases, a non-self-centering device may slip through the tunnel just like a button through the buttonhole with subsequent device embolization. They calculated the length of the slit-like tunnel from the circumference of the sizing button, and they suggested the corresponding device size according to the balloon size. However, other groups also have reported their own method of device size determination, and you can see uh, there is a wide separation between these two recommendations. Another principle of device size selection is that the radius of the device shouldn't be larger than the distance from the PFO margin to the aorta or, or the atrial loop. This is because uh, if the radius of the device is larger than the, the length of the, uh, the LT rim or SVC rim, uh, this may encroach onto the aorta or the, the atrial loop and potentially cause a device erosion at the impinging site. This slide shows the measurement of SVC rim and LT rim in bicaval view and short axis view of the transesophageal echo. However, if you consider the size of PFO and the length of rims together, less than half of the PFOs may fulfill this criteria. So many of the operators using Amplus PFO occluder do not seem to follow this rule uh, very strictly. Using a goceptal occluder may be a good option for patients with a relatively short LT rim, and uh, this has been my practice so far. However, unfortunately, the goceptal occluder has been withdrawn from the Korean market recently. You may also consider other software devices. Now I would like to conclude my talk with some uh, final thoughts. This slide shows options for patients with presumed embolic stroke of under, undetermined uh, source or stroke with a possibly causative PFO. The medical therapy has never been uh, investigated in the a randomized uh, manner, and uh, also uh, need uh, some lifelong uh, anticoagulation with uh, substantial risk of bleeding, and also uh, this is not safer than PFO closure. In this point of view, PFO closure in selected stroke patients with high risk of paradoxical embolism should uh, the, the PFO closure should be a uh, reasonable option and probably better than the other options. However, considering the high prevalence of PFO in general population, uh, there must be a substantial proportion of PFO as an innocent bystander. So this is the reason why continuous effort to differentiate the stroke by paradoxical embolism have to be made. Lope score has been suggested for this purpose I believe this is just the beginning of such endeavors and uh, has to be verified and modified. In, this, uh, in the meantime, clinicians should treat their patients with the best of current knowledge, techniques, and unbiased decision. 
Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh -huh.